Welcome back, welcome to week two of Math for Game Developers, where uh, this week we're going to talk about, let's say that you have um, decided which part of your program to optimize and you um, do a little bit of work on it, you get it to run faster. And now the most important question, oops, wrong tool, I always do that, is how do I know that it is faster. I mean, you made these code changes and theoretically they should make the code faster, but how do you really know that for sure? And in fact, if you think about it, you really can't even get started with this question without this question because you need to know what is the slowest part of your program in the first place so that you can so that you can optimize it. And so you know you need to know how fast the parts of your program are before you can do optimization. And so the answer to this is very simple. You are going to be a good scientist and you are going to measure. You cannot do any optimizations if you do not have a way to measure the, uh, the execution of your program. So, Back in the maybe the 1990s and before, the primary way to do this was cycle counting. Counting, that's math, right? This is math for game developers, and we now have counting. So that, that is the mathematics part of this video. Uh, what that is, is, is the, uh, the, the machine has a series of instructions that it executes. For example, it may add two numbers or it may move data from one place to the other. It may multiply two numbers and so on. And each instruction takes a certain number of cycles. And the, the cycles being the, the number of times that a processor can possibly do an instruction. So for example, for a modern processor, you might have something like 4.2 gigahertz, where giga means billion and hertz means cycles per second. So when you see that number, you're going to buy a computer and you see it has a 4.2 gigahertz processor. That means it can do 4.2 billion cycles per second. Or in other words, it can do 4.2 billion instructions per second. And so programmers would go into their program, they'd look at every instruction, they'd take out their their processor manual and they say, okay, well, this add instruction takes two cycles and this multiply instruction takes three cycles and this move instruction takes one cycle and say, so two plus three plus one is six. And so we'd have six instructions total in this section of the code. But if I make these changes, yada, 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 now I have five instructions and five is faster than six. And so my program is faster. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like that anymore. So I'm gonna to switch to red and I'm gonna cross this out. Cycle counting is now pretty useless. And the reason is, pipelining. Pipelining makes modern, com modern computing and, and programming on computers very fun. What pipelining is, is the processor can now execute multiple instructions at once. So, in the previous example, you had an add instruction or multiply instruction. The way processors worked a long time ago is it would wait for the add instruction to finish and then it would start the multiply instruction. But now it can start the multiply instruction while the add instruction is still running. So you don't take two cycles for this instruction and three cycles for that instruction. Um, because of this and many other things, the number of cycles to execute any particular instruction is just completely crazy. Um, and it's not very useful to know because between the pipelining and some other factors that I will get into later, um, it, it's really just not an issue anymore, which makes measuring the speed of code kind of subjective. If we can't, can't count the cycle, how many cycles it takes to do an instruction, there, it really becomes a lot harder to measure our program performance. So. Instead of that, we fall back to the next best thing, which is to measure the absolute time that it takes to, um, to execute a, a, a procedure or a series of instructions or, or whatever. And usually what we'll do this is in is milliseconds because 
uh, code on the computers are so fast these days that the code takes really almost no time to run at all. Milliseconds is actually almost too slow to measure instructions in because things happen in the order of nanoseconds. Um, and so a lot of the times you have the problem where th things are just too fast to measure. And so we'll deal with we'll show we'll show you in the next um, in the next part of the video how to deal with that. And the other problem is that things are machine dependent. Or you know what? I shouldn't even say machine. I should say environment dependent. When you're when you're measuring how long it takes to do a certain algorithm, it depends on the machine that you're on, but also on the uh, you know the pl the particular location the player is standing in your game. It could depend on anything and what direction he's looking and how many enemies he's previously killed. And there are so many factors that could affect the time, the running time of any particular algorithm. We have to take all of these into account. I mean, it's not just simple as putting a timer in to your program, although that is the first step, and we will go over it now. So how do we put a timer in our program to measure the running time of our program? It's If, if you have an idea in your mind of how you would do this, it is exactly like that idea. We just grab the current time you know, I promised that I would have good handwriting when I got this tablet, and I'm doing my best, people. I'm doing my best. And then you do your algorithm. Dot, dot, dot. This represents your algorithm right here. Ugh, that's bad. I can redo that. This represents your algorithm, your procedure that you are calling. And then you do T2, which is the time after the algorithm. You get that by, again, calling some kind of current time procedure. And then to find the elapsed time, you just do a little subtraction. Subtraction is math. We're definitely getting some math done in the Math for Game Developers videos. And then you have the amount of time that has elapsed uh, between the two. But the problem is a lot of, a lot of uh, procedures that return to you, the current time of the computer, they will return that time in seconds and seconds is just who damn slow and so we're going to use a special structure that has two parts it will give us the time in seconds and it will also give us the time which will be called milli tm in milliseconds i'm not going to write out milliseconds the abbreviation is ms see ms ms good and that is one one thousandth of a second. We're not going to go into nanoseconds because it's it's a little bit more diff. It's possible, but it's a little more difficult for a computer to measure nanoseconds, and it's not as accurate. That's not really necessary for us. Um, so we're just going to stick with mil milliseconds. That should do it for us. All right. So how do we get milliseconds out of this structure? Because it's going to give us time in seconds, so that'll be an integer, and it'll give us milliseconds that will also be an integer. And we want to get only milliseconds. And this, again, will be exactly the way you imagine it to be. You say t1.time, and then you multiply that by 1,000 to convert it into milliseconds. And then add that to t1.millitm. Semicolon. I forgot my semicolons over here, didn't I? And then you do the same thing with mt2 equals etc cetera, etc. Cetera. You know t2 that time times a thousand plus t2 dot milli tm. And then the last step is the same. You say the the time elapsed during your test is mt2 minus mt1. So now we have all the two tools that we need to start profiling our code and figuring out how long it takes to run, which will let us know um, if our optimizations are working. So let's go to the code section and see how that works. So here we are in the code section. I've set up some very simple code for us to optimize, or at least measure. We're not going to optimize this code. We're just going to measure it. Uh, and it is a simple loop from 0 to 1,000, and it sums each 
Um, so basically it's just summing all the integers between zero and 1000. And to time it, we're gonna use these F time procedures uh, in which we grab the current time before and after the procedure, the procedure that the code that we're testing. And let's take a look inside this time B structure so we know what we're dealing with. It should be exactly like I described in the video. We have the current time in seconds and the time in milliseconds. So we have to add those together in the right way in order to uh, get the time in total in milliseconds. And it's just like I did in the video. Actually, I did it slightly different in the video, but you should be able to see that these two are equivalent. We take the difference in seconds and convert it to milliseconds by multiplying by a thousand. And then we take the difference in milliseconds and the total gets us the elapsed amount of time. And then we output the result, so because we're curious about what you know what data we crunched, and then we output the amount of milliseconds that it took. So let's see what we got. And oh, zero milliseconds. That's how fast processors are these days. This is what I mentioned in the previous video. Even summing a thousand integers, which would take me personally, I mean, it would take someone like Euler maybe just a few seconds, but me. I would take a little bit longer to add up all the numbers between zero and a thousand. So I don't know, we're just gonna have to take the word of this computer that 499,500 is the correct answer. Maybe that'll be an exercise for you guys to figure that out, if that's, if that's the correct answer. I'm sure it is. Uh, but zero milliseconds is not a useful metric for us. In reality, this took something like two nanoseconds. And so we need to figure out how to make this procedure take long enough that we can measure it. And really the, the idea is exactly what's in your head. Let's run it a thousand times. Okay. And then measure the aggregate of a thousand times. So now every time we perform this, this, uh, this measurement, we're gonna do it on a thousand iterations of the loop instead of on one iteration of the loop. And that gets, that moves our three nanosecond running time into three millisecond running time, which is better. In this case though, it's still not enough precision for us. We wanna know a little bit more precisely how long it takes to run this procedure. And so we're gonna run it a, a million times instead of a thousand times and that gets us 2.51 seconds. So if we wanna know the actual running time of our procedure, then we would divide this by a million and we would get 2.51 nanoseconds, which is the actual running time. Now that's not entirely true. I know you guys are again already posting in the comments that, hey, you know, we have so many things about branching and, and cache misses and stuff. I'm gonna to get to that in the next few videos. So don't worry, we will get there. Um, but for now, it's, it's good enough for us to know a roundabout figure of how long it takes our procedure. And normally, procedures that we're going to be optimizing are going to be a little bit more complicated and take longer to run. So that won't be as big of a deal. In any case, um, there are other ways to do this. And I'm going to add a few more zeros here and run it again so that we can see there are programs that help you do this optimization. And you can see it's running now, it's crunching all the numbers from zero to a thousand, it's doing it a billion times. That will take a long time to run. While it does, I'm gonna bring up a program called Very Sleepy. Very Sleepy is a great uh, profiler that does all this timing for you. You just tell it to profile. I'm profiling now, I'm profiling my mfgd.exe little mi miniature algorithm that we've developed. We're gonna do it for about 10 seconds and then quit. And you can see, let's see if I can fit this on screen. You can see that it tells me exactly how much time I spent on each line of code. And that's important. So I spent half the time doing this, uh, doing this test in my loop, and I spent another half of the time doing the sum. So if we want to um, know where we're gonna start in our profiling, well, here it is, these are the two lines that take the most amount of time. Exactly how to do that profiling, I'm going to get to in a later video, but we will talk about that. So external profilers are really great, and then there are also internal profilers. Let's get rid of this. 
This is a small demo that I wrote a few days ago over a weekend because I was just having fun um, about flocking fish. This is a demo that has flocking fish algorithms and also some fluid simulation algorithms. And uh, I did it in my engine which has a profiler in it. And I'm going to show you this profile. It's over here on the right. Let's see. Oops. In there you can see the fish a little bit better. And you can see um, this fish school full think method is the flocking is the flocking um, procedure. You say it takes about three milliseconds to run. And this water think step is the fluid mechanics procedure. You can see it takes almost no time to run. It's, it's usually taking only zero milliseconds. And the particle system library takes uh, three seconds to, to simulate to do its thing. So here we have a pretty uh, good idea of what takes the longest time because our profiler tells us. So we, we, we can see that using the profiler is really important and measuring our code, the time that it takes our code to run. If I were to take a look at this profile profiler and say which of the, those things I should profile first, I'm, I'm sorry, I should optimize first, well the answer is none of them. Because look, start rendering up near the top is clearly taking the most time to run and so that's what I should that's what I should optimize first. So good, that's um, that's how to measure your, oh, and by the way, if you're using Unity or Unreal, I think Unity Pro has an optimizer as part of the engine, and Unreal I'm sure does. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with Unreal, but the engines that you're using almost certainly have features as part of them, just like this, that can help you um, do these optimizations. Okay, great. That was a really long video, but join me next time, and we're going to talk about how much speed up you can expect to get out of a pretty out of an, an optimization. I'll see you next week.